Welcome to The Leading Edge, an MIT webinar series focused on the latest in technology, innovation, and industry, brought to you by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. Today's event, Day 1 of the Innovation Journeys 2020, featuring Michael Schreg, Jonathan Haskell, Irene Omar, and Joseph Coughlin. And now for our host, Michael Schrag. Hello. Welcome to this panel. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to work with these excellent and perceptive speakers. My name is Michael Schrag. I'm a research fellow at the Sloan School's Initiative on the Digital Economy. I do work on network effects and have a book out on recommendation engines. This will not be a topic where we discuss recommendation engines, but we will be discussing recommendations. Um, what we're going to be discussing is different perspectives, a, an economic perspective, a demographic perspective, and a business perspective of what economic and business recovery is going to look like in a post-pandemic environment. We're going to have three speakers. They're going to talk about 20 minutes each. There are going to be five minutes of questions at the end of each of their talks. So I urge you to use the Q&A capability to submit questions. No guarantees that we'll get to all of them. After they're done, we're all going to get together and do a panel discussion for about half an hour. And we're also going to be looking for your feedback, but it's going to be very interesting to see where their perspectives converge and where they collide and I assure you my style as a moderator is such that I'm really not looking for consensus. I'm looking for key insights that are actionable for the members of this audience and participants. We are going to be looking for insights. We're going to be looking for frameworks. We're going to be looking for examples of what kind of steps individuals and organizations have to take to recover from what has been, frankly, a remarkably devastating and pervasive uh, pandemic set of circumstances. My first speaker, our first speaker, is an economics professor from Imperial, Jonathan Haskell. He's an advisor for the Bank of England. His book on capitalism without capital offers some very interesting insights about the role of intangible assets in value creation and economic growth. And he's going to be elaborating on some of those themes in his talk. Professor Haskell, may I ask you to take the stage? Michael, thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody from uh, sunny London. Uh, you see behind me Imperial College. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's in South Kensington in back of the museums. Uh, and I'm delighted to be talking to you um, uh, from Imperial. I'm afraid like everybody, I'm stuck at home, um, but uh, hopefully get the chance to meet you all at Imperial in London at some point. And I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about some observations on the future of the economy. Uh, and if I press this button, hopefully good things will happen. Uh, I hope you can see the next slide, which is gonna talk about the short term, which I'm going to say something about, and then very unoriginally, but I am an economist, I'm then going to be saying something about the long term and the medium term. Um, in the short term, we've seen the economy changing quite rapidly over the course of uh, uh, over the course of the pandemic. So let, let's have a little look on the left here. Um, this gives you some perspective about social spending. Social spending, of course, isn't all spending, but it is a lot of the spending which has been directly affected um, by the pandemic. So let me try and uh, put this up on the slide here. So you can see that this is a scale here about Google searches. So we're gonna use this to try to get absolutely up to the minute information about how social spending in some broad sense uh, is proceeding. And so what, what can you see? So, um, so social spending started collapsing before lockdowns. This is essentially when the lockdown is, um, but then once the 
easing came, you can see that social spending came back right back up again in Germany quite strongly. The United States is in green. And as I say, I'm over here in the UK. Uh, there's the UK uh, in blue. So the first point to make um, is that um, I don't want to minimize at all the seriousness of this pandemic. And many of you on the call will be in sectors affected by social spending, by that I mean hotels, restaurants, air travel, cultural events, things like that. Many of you on the call will be in this uh, uh, area and know the agony that's around here. Uh, but there does at least seem to have been some recovery. Now, what I'd like to do, though, is I'd just like to say two things um, about the recovery, two observations about the recovery, to try to make, take up Michael's challenge um, about some observations which are hopefully actionable, some observations which are hopefully um, uh, something we can learn from. Let me hop to the next slide. I'll come back to the other diagram in a second. Uh, the next slide tells you something about the mode in which people do their shopping. Um, and what you can see there is a big rise in um, what the Office of National Statistics here called non-store uh, um, spending, which of course is basically online. Uh, and here's the collapse in in-store in spending. So the collapse in in-store spending mirrors the kind of uh, collapse that we saw just a second ago um, with all these uh, uh, shops being locked down. It's been very difficult for people to go out to the store. Uh, people have obviously switched then to the online. But here's the interesting thing, um, maybe not surprising, but it is interesting, is that the online spending has stayed high even as the in-store spending has recovered. So in other words, it's not been the case that people suddenly went online and then they stopped going online. It's actually people are staying online. And I think it's quite interesting to reflect. It's very hard to know. But it's quite interesting to reflect about whether that might be a permanent feature of the economy going ahead. Uh, I promised I'd, uh, I'd talk about this other slide here on the right-hand side. So let me hop back to that. Um, now, this is, um, again, uh, right up to the minute data. This is up to the 15th of September. This is essentially, you could think of this as credit card data um, from a large credit card provider. Uh, and it breaks out the spending into a number of different dimensions, which I think are of interest and, again, might well match with the profile of industries uh, that many of the people on this call um, represent. Let's start with the spending around staples. And staple goods here are defined here, essentially food and housing and health. And you can see that staples, that's the pink line here, which I'm pointing to with the arrow now, have stayed fairly stable. In fact, they jumped up enormously at the very beginning of the pandemic. I'm sorry, I, sh I should say this is for the UK. They jumped up at the very beginning uh, and then have stayed high. So uh, obviously a lot of people were previously going to the bar or the pub in the UK. Um, uh, and then they said they went to the supermarket uh, and bought things there. Um, there are other aspects of the, spe of the spending here, uh, what we call delayable spending here, household goods, clothing, cars, that kind of thing. Uh, they fell very sharply, but again, have recovered quite uh, sharply. I'm going to be, there are too many lines here. You can see that brown line. And then these lower lines here are lines which have not recovered so much, social spending and work-related spending. Work-related spending is essentially transport in a very uh, uh, um, urbanized society like the UK. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, public transport is extremely important. Um, and you can see that's hardly recovered. And the social spending is the spending I was describing earlier on in restaurants and all that kind of thing as well. Now, here's the point that I wanted to make uh, to, to hopefully reward uh, looking at all these various lines. And it is this. I'm not sure about the argument in other countries, but one of the arguments in the UK goes, well, if the government chooses to do all this locking down, of course, it's going to trash the economy uh, and just look at the social spending. Uh, we had a lockdown, uh, but then the lockdown came off and the social spending has gone up. But as long as the government carries on uh, locking things down and providing restrictions and so forth, the economy is going to be trashed. And therefore, we face as a society a trade off. Either we, do, we lock down and defend health or we lock down and trash the economy. In other words, there's a trade-off between health and the economy. I don't want to argue that that's exactly not the right answer. And the reason I think it's not the right answer is that the social spending is not only determined uh, by uh, whether the uh, bar or pub or restaurant or hotel is locked down, but it's also determined by consumers' fears and consumers' uh, worry about the risk and so forth of infection. So just to show a little graph um, about that as well, it's a kind of rather noisy line. Um, the uh, blue line here, which I'm circling now, is the social spending line, which we saw just a second. Uh, and then this other line in the middle here, the sort of more solid line, whoops, which I'm pointing to now, sorry about my bad writing, 
Um, that is a line uh, which essentially tells you uh, some time series about how comfortable people feel about going and eating out. What you can see um, is that, at least in economics, that counts as a reasonably strong correlation, which is to say, over this period here over the summer, there was a rise uh, in the um, extent to which people felt uh, comfortable eating out and social spending thereby went up. So what's the point of the lockdown? The point of the lockdown is this. Um, uh, in the UK, there's now been a rise in infections uh, and that will probably, uh, we don't quite know this yet, but that will probably feed through into a fall in the confidence that people have about eating out. They'll probably report as being less comfortable uh, and that would reduce social spending irrespective of whether there's a lockdown or not. So as I say, I don't think it's true that it's a choice between the lockdown um, or the economy, because uh, if we don't lock down and the health gets worse, uh, then people will just choose of their own accord, whether there's a lockdown or not, not to go out and so forth. Um, so that's the first comment about the kind of short term reactions of the economy. Sure, they're going to depend upon the social circumstances and the policies and so forth that the government are going to adopt, but they're also going to depend upon individual uh, fears and attitudes and so forth. Um, let me turn now, um, Michael, if I may, to the sort of second part of what I wanted to say. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the longer term. Now, what we need to know at the longer term is we need to know the big question about how we think the economy is going to evolve, what's going to happen, what kind of economy it's going to look like. Um, and that's looking into a you know very difficult crystal ball. But uh, nonetheless, uh, let's uh, we've got to do something. Uh, so let's uh, have a little go. Uh, so one thing uh, that we do is the following. The Bank of England, with whom um, I have the privilege of being involved, uh, carries out a survey called the DMP survey, called the Decision, Maker, Decision Makers Panel Survey. Um, uh, you may be on a similar survey if you're in the US, which is carried out by the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And this uh, survey uh, goes out every month and it asks firms a big load of questions. Now, when we first started doing this survey a year ago, we, essentially, we asked them loads of questions about their sales and this, that and the other. And most of the questions we asked them were, guess what, all about Brexit. So I could talk for ages and ages and ages about Brexit. Um, but once we had the blessed relief of the pandemic, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. Once we had the pandemic to keep us occupied as opposed to Brexit, um, we then repurposed this and started asking various questions about the pandemic. And for those of you who are interested in British data, this is freely available. Um, and there's lots of interesting data here about what firms feel the effect of the pandemic is going to be. So here's the question here. I'm sorry, it's maybe a little bit small. It asks basically what their best guess is of what their unit cost cost impact is going to be of the various protective uh, policies that they've got to take, social distancing and all that kind of stuff. And it breaks it down by industry. So you can see that amongst recreational services here, uh, the average firm in this uh, sample, and this is thousands and thousands of firms, thinks there's going to be about a 20% increase in cost. Accommodation and food is around 15%. I'm pointing that now. Transport and storage, uh, sort of fairly similar. Uh, let's go down to, I don't know, um, information and communications, you know, ICT services and all of that. And um, that's fairly small with an average of around 7%. Um, so in a sense, this is not too surprising. The sectors of the economy who think that there's going to be the biggest increase in costs are the sectors who you would expect around recreational services uh, and so on. But it then leads to the question about how, and this is a very economics -y kind of index number question, is what does this mean for the economy as a whole? What would the hit in productivity be to all the cost hit to, to the economy as a whole be um, if you if this was replicated uh, throughout the economy and lasted for a long period of time. Um, and there are various different ways of weighting these things up by value added. Uh, and if there are any economists amongst you, a weighting system uh, named after two very famous economists, uh, Evsi Domar and Charles Holton. Um, and you get numbers like numbers between five and 11 percent. That's quite a large hit for the economy as a whole. And if there is that hit for the economy as a whole, I'll pop onto the next slide, um, something's going to need to change. So let's think about the business organization, uh, which might need to change uh, in the light of the, the, the cost is going to have to be accommodated in somewhere. We can't magic these costs out of nothing. Uh, firms might close down, wages, profits, land rents might take the hit. Um, or more interestingly, uh, maybe there's going to be some innovation. So let me spend the last couple of slides, and then I promise I'll stop, to say something about innovation. What do we know 
about the types of innovation uh, that these affected sectors um, are going to uh, have to. Um, now, many people on the call will be deeply involved in these particular sectors as well. So let me take a sort of 30,000 feet view um, about the types uh, of innovation spending uh, which might be made. Um, and maybe in the Q&A, uh, we could hear from individual firms. Uh, that 30,000 view is gonna proceed as follows. So apologies for this very busy slide. Let me walk you through the green box. If I can just ask you to look at the green box. Um, this is under the title here, what kind of innovation investment do the most effective sectors make? So let's start with R&D and ask ourselves if there's gonna be some innovation, how much R&D? Um, are these sectors doing? Here's the wholesale and retail trade. They're, we just saw they're affected. Here's transport, here's accommodation and food services, here's arts and recreation. So in red are the key affected sectors. Uh, what fraction, I'm sorry, these are British data, what fraction of R&D do these sectors do? Wholesale and retail does about 4% of R&D. Uh, these sectors do so little R&D, it's zero, and the art sector does 2% of R&D. Actually, not surprisingly, manufacturing does 43% of R&D. So if we were to ask the question, what innovation expenditures are these sectors making, going and looking at the R&D data, finding out whether there's a lot of patenting and so forth going on is not going to help us. So we need to look elsewhere. And that's what the next slide does. Uh, and the next slide picks up other types of, if I may call them intangible investment or innovation investment that these sectors make, software, training, uh, branding, market research, uh, investment in organizational capital, business processes, and so forth. And here you can see these sectors are very important. So for example, in software, wholesale and retail spends 18% of total spending on software. Um, likewise, they spend a lot on training. Um, here's the, uh, uh, the transport sector spends a lot on branding, um, you know, airlines and, 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 and so forth as well. Um, uh, accommodation, food services, uh, spends a lot on training as well. In other words, it's going to be this portfolio of sort of non R&D type of investment, which is going to be important for these firms. OK, um, I've got one more slide, uh, a kind of conclusion slide. So let me walk you through this slide um, and then um, and then I will um, stop. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, uh, the short term effect um, is going to be dependent on at least a couple of things, uh, the various government mandated measures uh, and the adjustment from consumer behavior um, as well. Um, as I mentioned before, that's going to get you uh, a, a, from a sort of a, a, a measurement and forecasting point of view and figuring out what the implications are for the economy or one's business into uh, some hard nitty gritty work about understanding what it is that consumers are going to do and understanding what it is that government are going to do as well. Um, one thing which I think is an emerging theme, at least in the UK and others, you know, come in on other countries is what I think of as being competition in quality. So if one thing that firms need to do is to provide, I'm, I'm, think, I'm talking about um, firms providing very social goods, restaurants and so forth. If the thing that firms need to do is to provide a, a sort of safe experience and a safe environment uh, for, their, um, for their customers, you could imagine that that would be uh, an area of, of sort of quality competition, which maybe firms haven't been thinking about very much. So some restaurants might be providing you know, quality in the sense of having tables a long way apart, um, having, you know, temperature screening of, you know, automatic temperature screening of your face when you come into the restaurant and all that kind of thing. And guess what? Those restaurants would build up a, a, a reputation for doing that. Other restaurants may not be paying quite so much attention, uh, but they might be doing something else. So I think we might see the emergence of quite a different dimension of competition between firms as a way of chasing after that consumer um, behavior. So that's one set of sort of short term, maybe that's a sort of somewhat medium term um, consideration as well as I said that emergence of quality competition. Um, let's talk about the longer term here. As I mentioned, these raw cost forecast imply substantial level falls that will need a lot of adjustment. Um, uh, I've talked about the, the innovation which is needed. Uh, uh, and in my kind of language, uh, that's these types of intangible knowledge types of investment. Uh, not conventional R&D, but more like business process engineering. Um, here's a figure which I didn't say. The most effective sectors make 40% of that unmeasured investment. Um, so let, let, me, let me just say a word about what I mean by unmeasured investment. Uh, th th those, those of you uh, 
on, on the call, I mean, every firm on the call will understand this. Um, accountants are typically not very confident. Uh, sorry, let's do it the other end. Accountants are typically very confident about counting investment when a company invests in a new jet or a new um, airplane or a new uh, piece of cat or a new building or something like that, right? Accountants know how to value that, that goes onto the balance sheet and so forth. Accountants under quite understandably are much less confident when it comes to valuing investment in software or branding or building a business process. So a lot of that stuff isn't invested and in, it isn't counted in that way. Um, and some of the work that we try to do at Imperial is to try to use other surveys to try to figure out how much firms are making, uh, how much firms are investing in those hard to count items. Um, and the most affected sectors, so here's a kind of takeaway figure for you, are making around 40%, almost half of all, all the unmeasured investment. So that's the investment in branding and training and so forth, um, which accountants find, so find it so difficult um, to measure. Um, now, uh, that means uh, that their measured productivity will probably stay very low. So when you, on something called J-curve effects, let me just say a quick word about this and apologies if this is somewhat of a kind of economics -y sort of thing. Um, here's the idea. If a firm is busy investing in a new building uh, or a new vehicle or a new piece of plant, that's all measured. That will register uh, as an increase in their capital and increase in their productivity. If they're investing in training, if they're investing in um, you know, improving the branding and reputation and the quality, as I mentioned earlier on, um, of their establishment, that's often not measured. So it looks like they're not very productive because they're making all these investments here, which that turn out not to be counted. So we might be seeing a situation in which you as a firm might be investing like mad uh, in and making yourself productive and attractive uh, to consumers, but that won't show up um, in the aggregate figure. Very last point here um, about working from home. Here's a little graph here of the percentage of working adults who are working from home, uh, which at least in the UK, which got up to almost 50% actually is now around 30% uh, there as well. Um, I have to say, uh, at least as economists and, and, and happy, Michael, if you want to bring other disciplines in on this conversation, at least as economists, um, we have very mixed results on working from home. Some results in economics show quite positive effects of working from home. Uh, other results show it, it show that people get lonely and dispirited and all of that. And the people who do work from home maybe work a little bit harder, but they don't get promoted because they're not in the eyes of the manager and so forth. So um, that, I'm afraid, uh, is, a, is, a, is a sort of untrodden area as far as many economists are concerned. Um, but lastly, I say something about the internet. Um, of course, we didn't know it. But the investment we made in the internet uh, has enabled us to have the kind of conversation we're having now. If you could imagine doing this over the phone, um, that would have been very difficult to mimic. So what's interesting um, is how big a change we've made in the economy. Um, and, we, uh, 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 and we've had some, at least some pieces of capital equipment uh, which have turned out to facilitate that change. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, everybody. No, thank you very much, Professor Haskell. We do have a couple of questions, and I, of course, have a couple of questions for you. I, I think it was a very, very well done, uh, comprehensive view, but it raises an obvious question. You relied rather heavily on British statistics. I would like to, to ask you, and I don't think this is unfair, to what extent do you believe many of the insights that you offer, as opposed to the statistical breakdowns per se, are extensible to global markets, to Europe, to Asia, to Latin America, to North America. What are the two or three principles that you would say, yes, I really expect to see these sorts of effects as it manifested globally? I would expect, so thanks for the question, Michael, and it's a good question. I would expect to see these kinds of effects quite similar in European and North American um, markets um, because they're economies of similar structure. They're developed economies dominated by the service sector with a reasonably well-functioning, you know, internet and telecoms uh, structure uh, and the ability, therefore, to, um, at some cost, admittedly, um, but to make these quite profound sort of changes. Um, and as I saw, I'll click back on the slides there, you can see some comparative data on the left-hand right. side. I'm sorry that, 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 that that's so messy. Um, why don't I try and talk and, and rub it all out at the same uh, time as well, which might help. There we go. Um, so there's some comparative um, data there. So I think we've seen, Michael, some similar kind of effects across those different countries. What's interesting, though, 
of course, is the ones who are looking very closely at these slides with their glasses off and their noses you know, next to the screen, uh, will see that the um, different countries have recovered in different ways. Right. So there is a fascinating question, uh, which we haven't got to the bottom of, I have to say, about why it is that different economies react in different ways uh, to the pandemic. That's a live question, which is rather hard to say. I'll say one more thing about your question, Michael, if I may. Um, Asian economies, less well-developed um, economies emerge economies, much harder to say, different types of infrastructure, much more manufacturing focus, rather less service focus and so forth. So um, there may be a slightly different story to tell there. Absolutely. And of course, we have Irene Omar, who's one of our, our participants from, from Malaysia. So there will absolutely be some insight in that regard. One last question in the interest of time here, and this is an audience question. You know, you talk about 40% R&D or branding or quote unquote intangible investment. One thing that you did not mention, which I am going to explicitly push you on, particularly because of the UK and the US and indeed Asia, what role do, do you expect to see venture capital, venture funding, startup funding to play as a, a if not a prime mover, a catalyst for different kinds of growth in a macro level and for the various sectors that you've identified? Uh, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question, Michael, but in the interest of time, I'll be, I'll be very brief, um, but, but that's not to cast aspersion on what is a good question. Uh, this type of uh, spending, this very intangible type of spending, is a type of spending which conventional banks find it quite difficult to deal with. They're very used to lending against commercial property, uh, against vehicles, against very tangible things as collateral, again, quite understandably. So this type of spending is much more difficult for them, uh, and that requires an alternative institutional arrangement. Now, venture capital capital is extremely successful in the US and especially uh, where you know you're sitting in the northeast of US as well as well as Silicon Valley it's proved to be rather less successful I have to say uh, here in Europe for a set of very difficult reasons I think um, so the burden will fall more on venture capital because we've got this very as it were unconventional type of spending which is in front of us uh, and so a big policy issue uh, is whether venture capital can handle it both in the US, but particularly in the UK, where in, in Europe, UK and Europe, where it's much well less developed. Yes, your UK versus Europe thing harkens back to your Brexit point. But oh. that's, a, that's, a, that's a panel discussion for another day and perhaps another sponsor. I want to thank you for your remarks and I'm very much looking forward to our further interaction in, in, in the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. 